So we'll get going. Um, welcome, everyone, um, uh, to this session of the Joy of Abstraction book. Um, today's session, we're going to be speaking about the chapter towards which we have been working, which reflects kind of the gateway to category theory, um, to categories as formally construed. And um, these previous chapters um, have been leading up to that, um, laying the groundwork in various specific forms um, for some of the ideas that we'll be covering uh, today and uh, as needed in further sessions as well. Uh, so, um, if you've all had a chance to review it, um, I think you'll be equipped to start to think about, um, you know, what is it that uh, uh, that these chapters, these preparatory chapters, um, have uh, sought to to build? How does that map to what we've seen in this chapter? So, uh, just to remind us, you know, uh, chapter eight uh, is what we're discussing today, and that's uh, on on categories. Uh, but we've, prior to that, seen successive chapters on uh, relationships, on uh, abstraction, on patterns, context, formalism, and in chapter seven, equivalence relations. Um, and you've had a chance now to review a little bit about the definition of, of categories in, in chapter eight. Um, can anyone comment on, you know, that how that relates to some of these earlier topics? Let's pick maybe relationships. Um, uh, where are, where do relationships figure within what you read in, in chapter eight, what you read about about categories, where where do relationships come up? Where are they sort of captured in a in definition of a category? In the morphisms. In the morphisms, yeah. These trolls to go by the name arrows. Um, uh, they have source and target, and as she says, as Eugene Chang says, they they describe uh, some sort of relationship between the source and the and the target, right? Um, now, they're not totally unrestricted. There, there's a recognition that there's enough structure that certain relationships we can take for granted. Can anyone mention a sort of relationship kept in a morphism that we're sure exists for a given object? Yeah, identity. identity, yeah, identity. Now that's it's easy to state uh, goodly, but but as we'll see, what constitutes an identity relationship in one category may be quite different from another. Like in one category, it may be the object is less than or equal to itself, and another identity is the object divides itself evenly. Another is the object. You know, there's a, a, a some function from a set to itself. That's the identity function. It maps A to A, and B to B, and C to C. You know, with, with from one set to that same set maps each element to itself. So, you know, it doesn't change anything. Um, that's always always there, um, even if there are no other morphisms. Even if we have what's called a discrete category, right? These objects or small categories set, we always have these these identity morphisms. Um, even if there's no other morphisms linking, even if there's no other morphisms that go from the object back to itself, there's always these. In fact, they're so ubiquitous, you don't even draw. Right? They're always implicitly present. Um, 
what they mean. Again, concrete terms are different, but it, it, as she said in an earlier chapter, you always have some relationship for, for the things capturing in categories. You always have some relationship of kind of sameness or this thing is related to itself. What does that remind you about for what we saw last time in terms of these equivalence relations? What, what sort of thing is, are these sort of self arrows from an object to itself that are its kind of identity self arrows? What do those represent? Like what, what do they remind you of? Is it symmetry? Reflexivity. Reflexivity. A-R-A, exactly, no, A-R-A, yeah, yeah, that's right. It's, it's formally called reflexivity. Okay, so that's that's good for relationships. The way we capture these relationships in, in general, this is always a discrete category where there's nothing else here, but the way in general, kind of having a relationship with the other category, we'll have morphisms, we'll have arrows from one object to another, right? Mm -hmm. That was described in that. In the, in the chapter here, okay. Um, uh, context. Where does kind of context? So relationships to the subject of joint abstraction, chapter five. Where does context come in? Where did like why is that relevant to categories? Where do where do categories try to capture context? In, in the selection of the objects and morphisms between them, like if we define the morphisms of being family relations, then we're talking about the family context, but if we're talking about the relation, it earns more money than or something that's a different context. Yeah, so the, the notion of what these things represent, I mean, that's, um, that's something that sort of fits in the context, and, and that, that's true. Um, sort of the, the types of Thing of relationships mean capture reflect the context, but uh -huh. in which of them that they have relationships. That, that's not true. So as we're gonna see, one of the big ways we capture context, um it's a little bit deeper, um is uh you know the the network of arrows, the network of morphisms incident on that sort of head into an object and head out of an object. There's a saying in English that you know a person by the company they keep. And, and there's this very much this philosophy and category theory that sort of an object is defined not by something inside of it. We're not looking inside of it and saying, aha, there's little elements there. Instead, we're asking what's the role it plays in the category? What's the role it plays in its context in terms of arrows coming in and in terms of arrows going out? And those arrows, in fact, by the UNATO, those arrows sort of uh, completely define what's going on at that object. Okay, they, they um, define kind of what that object is. Um, we don't have to appeal to its kind of internal character. An object is a dot here. Okay. Um, yes. The first stage, uh, she said, a uh, data is the linkers, like for example, the break and uh, yes. and a uh, structure of these things uh, um, we do for um, right for uh, this thing and. Properties are the rules. Can we say properties are a concept? Are what? Concept. Properties are con well, they're they're more than concepts, right? They're they're like they're 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 axioms, they're things that are are basic laws, as she puts it. She uses two synonyms for properties, basic laws. They're kind of stipulations of things that hold true so that it behaves reasonably, like so that things behave reasonably. Um, I'll, uh, you know, I, I think we, we like systems, for example, which are associative, meaning that we don't have to remember where the parentheses are, that, you know, if we have, if we have a context where we have um, A plus A, or A plus B plus C plus D, um, 
well, even let's we'll just do a quick three. It, it's it's particularly well behaved. Just to, you know, context where we're doing something like this is particularly well behaved. If we don't have to remember where the parentheses are, and that may sound like a weird thing, but let me let me sort of give an example. If we don't have to worry about whether it's this, you first do a plus b, and then you do a plus c, or whether you do what's the other one that is possible, a plus b plus, b plus c. Um, the fact that we don't have to remember, like we don't have to know which of these it is if they're different, gives a extra power and clarity and, and kind of flexibility in, and it makes it kind of well behaved, nice, right? If we, if we had to kind of distinguish a plus b plus c from a plus b plus c, then you know these parentheses get in the way and it's kind of awkward. And as we're going to see, there will be cases where we deal with that explicitly in category theory. But one thing we we, we kind of like the composition of arrows. If we have an arrow from a to b, these are objects, right? Uh, Arrows, morphism, go from object to object, right? We have an arrow F. We have another arrow G. Mm -hmm. And and then we have another one H, right? What would what would associativity say? This the kind of basic law, of this axiom. What what would it say here? That makes it well behaved by analogy to this. Anyone? Well, do you remember in in category theory we have this basic notion of composition, right? We put two arrows together. Do you remember how we one major way we write composition of let's say G after F? Does anyone remember how we do that? Yeah, we do a circle. Which one goes first? This is yeah, so so first let, let's consider F and G first, and then we'll consider the, okay. I'll I'll make the whole thing. Sure. It's H after, and this is the best, you know. I find it's very helpful to think about it. This is after H after what? G after F. And and that's that's great to rec to, to write it that way. It's kind of like you first do F. Then you get a result and you apply G to it, and then you get a result and apply H to it, right? It's I kind of think of it a little bit like H of G of F of whatever X takes, right? F of X. Um, and, and and that's a particularly kind of nice way. But the other way that we write it to indicate composition is what? Does anyone remember? HGR. So okay, so yes, this, it turns out. <laughs> That we often just write this as HGF, it's true. Um, that, that putting them next to each other is composition. But there's actually another way to write like this in a different order. And it's F fat semicolon, then G fat semicolon, and then uh, H. So that means kind of do this first, then do this, then do this. And this is more common, somewhat more common, but you'll often also see this. Okay, if we have this, what is, so So this is your kind of notation for composing things. What does associativity tell us here? Can anyone say? What, what does it mean for this to be associative? Uh -huh. It would be chain if you H of G of F in brackets, and the same as doing H then G, and then F afterwards. Yeah, okay, so if you, you're getting the, the basic idea here. You know, if we do, and we could write it either way, but one way to write it would be H of G, you know, H after G after F equals H after G, right? Um, uh, after F. Kind of, you could compose these two first and then do this, or you could do this and and then compose it with the result of composing this two. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so, so the fact that that um, it's associative is really nice. It's, it's and it's a, it's one of these axioms. It's a property. It's sort of something on which we can count that makes it not. We by the same analogy, we don't have to keep track of where the you know where the the um, and the the, uh, the parentheses are right, and she she illustrates this graphically right with um, with these uh, with these kind of nice arrows right on Eugenia Chung with these nice arrows on page one hundred one, um, which uh, she uses to kind of illustrate this associativity. So it's a these are these are properties. These are axioms. These are things on which we can count in terms of equivalence that are are nice properties. And in fact, she has something you know written down with the pluses. Right? Doesn't matter where you have to place your parentheses. That gives you a certain amount of of freedom. Right? Um, which is is rather nice. Um, so, so just continuing on sort of some of these, you know, relating to earlier, um, earlier ideas, where is abstraction? So it's, chapter two is all about abstraction. Where does the ability to, to engage in abstraction, ability to, to work with abstraction, where does that come in with this whole categorical picture? Anyway? Can anyone sort of suggest a few ways that that when we're working with categories, we're dealing with something that can capture these different abstractions in a in a flexible way? Yeah. Because the object's not like really focused on what the actual value is going to be. It's yeah. Ah, yeah. It's a little bit reminds me a little bit of encapsulation in software engineering. Encapsulation, you know, we like we'll have some computation and maybe it's a sort will encapsulate whether it's a bubble sort or a quick sort or a merge sort or a heap sort or whatever and um quick sort and we'll just encapsulate that and it's an abstraction we don't have to deal with the details right we can deal with the role it plays what it does and, and not how and it it turns out that um that our our choice of of these objects and, and relationships reflects this ability to abstract. And although you won't be seeing it for a little bit in its fulsome character, um, what you'll see is that these objects, what's an object in, when you're looking at it here, maybe, maybe we have uh, Category like this, we'll we'll see this in a, in a little bit. I'll label them with two things that will seem kind of a little bit uh, mysterious, but um, like this E and B, two morphisms between them. What's kind of in you know with these objects? What they kind of represent? Um, uh, we're hiding, we're hiding here, right? Um, but one thing that is very common is that the Arrows, whatever these things are, the arrows typically represent something that preserves structure that's relevant. And, and this is just a general sort of rule. David Spivak comments it in some in a place that I'll I'll be posting the slides for this where, where, where he makes his comment. But he says, look, when you have a categorical diagram, it's very common that that objects you don't look inside them. But commonly they, they you know they, they represent something. So so um it may be a set, in which case it is really virtually no structure. There's not there's no sort of internal structure to it, it's just this the bag of numbers. Um or it could be a uh, it could be something more structured, like it could be that it represents a a graph. This this dot represents a graph, or it could be it represents a stock flow diagram, stock and flow diagram, or a petri map. 
Um, and it turns out that we use categories for to represent these things many different contexts. But one thing that holds is generally these arrows are going to preserve the structure. So with with sets, you don't have to really worry about it because there's no structure really to preserve. There's no internal structure of set. But for a stock and flow diagram, this would be a stock and flow homomorphism. It'll be a sort of this collapsing of one stock and flow diagram to another in a way that preserves behavior. Like you again, you class people who are you know hiding out from COVID-19 because they've been told to versus those that are hiding out from COVID-19 because they think they may have been exposed or something. You collapse them into one category. So there's there's this notion of homomorphism. This is the graph. These are graph homomorphisms, the, the, the arrows. So it's very common that we have objects that represent different things. And in fact, what, what's going to happen with an abstraction is we're going to have a category which might represent a schema. And we'll, we'll see how that then defines a particular graph. And then we'll have, we'll zoom out, and there'll be a category where all the objects represent these, these graphs. Each object is graph, or each object is a stock flow diagram. But then there'll be other times where we zoom in and it's like, this will be the schema for a graph and we'll map it over into sets. And this is each of this, and this 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 and some set, this and this and this functions between sets. And, and we're dealing with much lower level kind of notions um, is we'll, we'll all the time go between these categories. So here's the category of, uh, of uh, you know, um, graphs. Um, this is the schema for graphs that will define a given graph by mapping it to set. And then we'll zoom out again, and then we'll be considering the category of small categories, which where each dot is a category. Um, and that's really cool. Um, and we'll then zoom out again and be dealing with you know, a category of functors from one category to another. But but enough enough said. We're, my point is that abstraction is built into this idea, just as Larissa said, we have this object and we encapsulate what it is. We don't look inside it. Okay. Much of category three gets kind of a philosophy from not looking inside instead. Dealing with how the role it plays. I said this earlier. So this may be a set in some cases. This this could be a set, but instead of looking inside of it at its elements, we ask, what are the the the, the functions that map to it, and what are the functions that map from it, and from that we know what set it is. It turns out we don't have to look at its elements individually. So okay, so let, let's. Let's talk about this uh, a little bit more because these are our deep ideas. There was a chapter earlier which was about equivalence relations. That was just the last chapter when we were together. Right? What do what do equivalence relations? So we've seen the rules for categories now, right? Um, here we go, page one hundred two, right? Yin uh, Chang reads a category C consists of she has three categories, data, structure, properties, right? These axioms, these stipulations for to be well-behaved. Right? Um, one of them was that associativity. Another was unit laws, for example. Um, we'll come back to those. But how do those relate, these things, how do they relate to what we saw with equivalence relations? Does anyone recognize some common themes there? Yeah, um, they they all have that reflexive uh, relationship. Good. They all have something analogous to transitivity. Excellent. Uh, except Excellent. these ones, uh, you know, category relations don't have this symmetry. They don't have the symmetry. Yeah, and we'll see something like symmetry, as, as she says in the book, start to come in when we have um, this notion of isomorphism. We may see that before the end of the class today, if not next time. Um, but but this kind of should remind you a little bit. It's like it whispers of equivalence relations, but a relaxed notion of equivalence relation where we don't 
rigidly require everything to be symmetric, right? Um, uh, so the data are objects, the arrows and the, the arrows, right? From things from A to B, yeah. Um, and then we have this structure. And what is the structure? What's capturing the structure according to her on page 102? There are two things she lists under structure. What are those things? Identities. Yeah, identities and the composition. What, what, what is this? When we say identities, what are we talking about? We said it earlier. I just want to be very quick. Yeah, the selves, the, the, the selves that are identities. I, I want to be careful here. One of the most common, common misunderstandings people make when learning category theory, I find, is that, um, you know, I back in the day, remember making this, uh, getting confused about this, that when we have an object, it is true that there are these identity loops, right? There are, there are identity morphisms from it to itself. But that doesn't mean every morphism from it to itself is an identity morphism. No, 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 no. There, there may be others. I mean, and, and often there are zillions. Maybe a limited number of others, which are not identity, but there's one of them, which is identity. Can you expand on that? Can sure. you give an example on that would be that? Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, I'll give. Well, wait, I didn't have one. Yes. Maybe multiplication with zero, because zero times zero would give you zero, but then like the identity in itself is not zero, it's like one. Okay, I I like where you're going, but it, no. I'm gonna direct that a little bit different. You're you're not in a bad area. You're in a quite close area. Let's let's talk. So there's many categories. Categories are a friend, and it's important to realize categories are many different sorts. And one of the things we'll see is that some categories are so simple in their structure, they're so limited. They're thin in their structure, almost emaciated in their structure. They only have either zero or one morphisms from one object to another. And those won't be as interesting because for those, the, the identity one is the, from an, uh, an object to itself will be the only one because you can only have zero or one from a given object to another object, okay? But there's, there's a category that's a really important category, but it's not privileged, but it's really important for us as computer scientists. And it's a category of sets and functions. Okay. I actually have a picture of it here. And it's a particularly bad picture, but maybe it's worth 500 words. So I'll show it. Okay. Uh, and um, I, I apologize for my lack of artistry, right? Um, so let's see if I can call this up. Okay, why am I not? Ah, here we go. Okay, okay. So somehow I'm off the um, off the uh, what I can I can see here. Okay, so ah, there it is. Yes, there it is. There. Oh, the dream of centuries. Okay. Um, what what screen am I recording on here, Nestor? What what can you see? Can you only see my face? Uh, yeah, I can. Okay. I, I'm I sorry. can't see the yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, So let me let me see if uh, I'm gonna see if I can share this other screen. Okay. Um, can you see uh, a thing that says category of sets and functions here? Yeah, I can see. Okay. Okay. So I don't want you folks to get like too focused on this category, too like to to privilege it. Mm -hmm. One of the problems computer scientists like us also often have is like we get fixated on this category and we should, okay? Um, but it's a really important category. So here are the objects are sets, okay? They're sets, right? Here's a set of false and true. Mm -hmm. Here's a set of three minus, uh, three, five, and minus four. Here's another one, it's 2.3, 4.78, and minus 4.1, okay? Um, those are the objects. The objects are sets. Here, here um, anyone know what that fancy looking Z represents? Integers. Here, anyone know what this fancy looking N represents? Natural, natural numbers. What, what's, what's the difference between natural numbers and, and integers? 
Um, you know, depending on which you talk to, it does or does not include zero. You got it. You got it. I'm going to use it by default. I'm going to use it to be uh, include zero. Okay. Just, but again, let's not get caught up in names, right? Um, it, but for most of my uses, I use it to include zero. Okay. And you'll see that in most category three videos, they, they use it to include zero. But Z is what? Well. Z includes. All positive and negative. All positive and negative. And yeah, zero. numbers. That's right. And zero. Yeah, exactly. Good. Yeah. Good. Next slide. And, and so those are here too. Those are just the objects. Those are just objects in this category, right? Those are, those are objects. They're, they're, they're mighty big objects, ain't they? Um, in fact, they're, they're infinite objects here. Um, but they're there. R plus is. Positive reals, R is reals, right? <laughs> That's a really big one, right? Um, okay, but those are the objects. Really, when in category theory, a lot of the the those are just the nouns, the action, the verbs are the other verbs. They're the really things that are interesting here in category theory. It's about the morphisms. It's about the things that do things. And here, the morphisms are familiar things to computer scientists. They are, guess what? Functions, they're functions. Now, what's the job of a function um, from one set to another? What does a function do? It maps. And, and if we say that the function from one set to the other, what does it do for each of the elements of the domain, the thing from which it maps, the source of, you know, the source of it? That's a set. When I say it's a function from Three, five, minus four to false and true. What is it doing? Mapping for the elements. Okay, so mapping and what does that mean? That's, that's it like takes every element within the domain to an element. Within exactly. Each of these elements in the domain, three, is maps to one of either true or false, right? One exactly one. Each each um, each, so so three maps to one of these true or false. Five maps to one of those true or false, and four maps to one of those true or false, right? We for for a total function, we cannot not map one, right? We have to have a mapping for every one. It can only go to one, right? Right? And we're going to talk more about functions later. We're going to distinguish what's called a surjective function from a non-surjective, whether it maps to all of the results or but um. Is it possible in general that, that three and five could be mapped to the same thing? Yeah, there's no problem. Is even could map them both three and five to what? False, right? Whereas minus four would be true, right? Um, that, that's what a function does, right? Its job is to map from each of the inputs, possible inputs, give each of them a value in the, in the code of the in this case, the set, false and true, right? The code of it, the, the thing into which they map, right? So, so, so those are the morphisms here. Um, and I'll be with you just a second, Eric. But what is, what do you think the identity morphism is here? What is the identity morphism? Which I haven't even drawn, like convention. What's the identity morphism? Um, I don't know. Oh, oh, okay. All of them itself. So I, I think you got the idea. Just like the identity function, like it returns the same right. set. So, so remember, an identity morphism for an object goes from where to where. What, where does it come from? What, what is the source? Okay. The to, to itself. That's right. So it goes from like three five minus four back to three five minus four. And what is its mapping? That's a mapping. It's a function, right? It maps from for each of three, five minus four, it maps it to one of one of three, five minus four. And what does the identity one do? What does it map three to? Three, three, five, three, five. three, five to five minus four to minus four, right? That's an identity one. Right? So then like the morphism that is not the identity morphism could theoretically map three to the negative four. Precisely. Yeah. Oh, okay. Precisely, precisely where I was going. Exactly. It could it could do it could map three to minus four and it could map five to itself and it could map 
minus four to itself, right? I mean, I mean that that's not an entity, right? But it is a self-morphism that's going from three five minus four to three five minus four, right? How how about if you're dealing with um say natural numbers? What would be something from natural numbers? So so if we consider natural numbers zero, one, two, three, four, et cetera, what would be the identity mapping from natural numbers to natural numbers? What would zero be mapped to? Zero. One, two, one, two to two. Good. How about a non identity mapping from the naturals to the naturals? Does it matter if it's surjective? Like, why is it just time 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 matter? Does it matter? Yeah, yeah, times two. Yeah. Maps zero to zero. Maps mm -hmm. one to what? Two. two. Maps two to four. Yeah. Or square would be an yeah. answer. Right? Would that be that would be a self move because yes. the entire codomain is still a subset of the natural numbers. Yeah, I mean you could declare it as mapping from this domain to this same same as same set as the codomain, and, and it would it would not map to all of the things. That's fine. Fine, there's no problem with that. If we consider it as mapping from this set to the same set, sure. Sure, there's there's no problem. Um, it's not saying that's the smallest step. Later, we're, later we're going to come up with this notion of epi mono factorization and so on that will relate. Could we get a smaller set that that's more efficient in some sense that it it's epi onto it, surjective onto? But no, we're not going to deal with that right now. And, and we could consider that as a self map from three to five or from from naturals to naturals, right? Um, now, there might be some mappings like the absolute value from Z from all integers might map to, we might consider the codomain, the, the, the thing mapped to, to be naturals, right? Because negative two would map with absolute value would map to what? Two. Yeah. And so in minus one would map to one, and zero would map to zero. And so we can think of it as, you know, mapping at that point. Now, again, this is the category of sets and functions. This is one heck of a big category, right? Um, don't try to do this at home, all right? Uh, um, so don't say load her up, you know, to your computer or something, right? So if you have right. a, a set of, of, of strings here, um, this is all possible strings. I just didn't type all of them. I didn't, you know, I had to get to class, right? Um, so I didn't type all the possible strings. But imagine you had all possible strings. You could have a length function that, that takes you know each of them to their length and it maps from a set of all possible strings to natural numbers, right? Right? The smallest possible is zero. There might be some that like this one, empty string would go to zero. A itself would go to one, a a would go to two, etc. Right? Yes. Oh no, we, that's what I said. I'm going to be defining it as a natural. We, we, so, we have uh, sorry? We have to uh, well, okay. I'm going to use this specifically to mean zero, and that's very common to also include zero. That's actually very common. It, there's a difference in math, how mathematicians, whether it's defined with zero, and I'm going to go with the mathematicians who are most category theorists I know who will include it with zero. Not that it's particularly hugely important, but yeah, we distinguish whole numbers, which I think are W, um, which are one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera. But in any case, um, I'm not gonna get into that fight. I'm just gonna define, I'm gonna use this. When you see this for me, it's gonna be zero, one, two. And the same thing is true for the videos I'm gonna send you. They all use it to include zero, okay? Um, so what I'm what I'm saying here is this is this this is the category. So we, we said what's the identity, and you told me we talked that through. What is composition here? What is composition? Yes, okay, that's right. And so what would it be? So uh, Tony, yeah. Good, good. So, yeah, so for example, you could go from 
you, you could go from, okay, that, I don't show the arrows that way, but yes, you could do it. Or you could go from reals with the ceiling function to get integers. And then you can go with the absolute value to get naturals, right? And you can compose those functions. So you have a function that takes reals and gives you naturals. All you do is you compose the function. You take what the first function gives you, <laughs> And you give that to the second function and, and, and you return the results, right? Um, that's, you compose functions. So that should be fairly fairly intuitive, I think, right? Um, if we write in computer science terms, if we were to write, you know, uh, given, a, a given uh, and I'll write it in, in sort of Haskell notation, but um, given a, an X in the reals, right? Um, I will apply absolute value. So to the, the ceiling uh, of X, right? That would now map, right? Um, so given an X, I map it to absolute value of ceiling of X. That's, I'm just writing this with some Haskell notation that I won't require you to know. Um, but but we'll we'll use it occasionally. So all I'm doing is I'm composing it. So I'm doing absolute value after ceiling to get a function that is the composition. Does that make sense? The composing functions is something you can do. You take the result of the first and you give it to the second as the input to the second and you get the result. So then we can compose functions in different orders only if you can make that happen. Only if they can line up. up. Yeah, only if they, just like we can only compose arrows if they're end to end, right? Um, we can only compose functions if they are compatible with the first giving results in the same domain as I think things. Yeah. So like, True, like the natural, because there's no error from the natural numbers to the length, and like you would not be able to do the first. Co correct. I mean, what so could we put if you gave a different rule? Or right. Not, right. I just happened to draw some, yeah. right? Um, because uh, there's an unlimited number, but <laughs> I just want to illustrate and get your get your thinking a little bit more creatively. Oh yeah, there are strings here. One thing we could do is we could propose. How could I go from strings to booleans here, Ashton? How could I? What could I do? If if, if I'm given a string, so, so for any string, I could ask if its length is even, right? Right, and that will give me a boolean. All I do is compose those functions and say take its length and then pass it and ask if it's even. Does that make sense? Okay. So so um. Uh, Larissa, do you have a question? Maybe um, I might have just missed this, but yeah. when mm -hmm. when for the identity, because it's like yeah. it's supposed to always be there, like you know, from the error. But yeah. if there is hypothetically another morphism to the object itself, like should it like is it like required to explicitly be stated because it's sort of like no, if there's another self morphism, yeah, no, it's always there. There's always an identity, so we no, don't have any draw. Yeah, we will draw a self, other self okay. And in fact, I'll get to an example in just a moment from the scene. Okay, sorry. Um, so so that's that's uh, a good, great question. We will, in general, draw self morphisms, except the one that's always present, which is the identity. Yeah, Tony. And uh, will there be a system of morphism coming from the like of um, integer to a uh, real number? From integers to real numbers. Yeah, there would be. I just didn't have to draw it. You could, it's interesting. You could say that there's an injection morphism, which just considers any integer a real number, for example. Um, uh, but there, there's others as well, right? You know, square root of, of well, not square root. <laughs> uh, uh, so cube root of an, of an integer would give a real. Um, and and so that you know that would be an example of a morphism, or, or divide by two, right? Um, uh, would be a morphism that would go that you could consider as going from integers divide by two to to reals, right? So it would map one to point five. It would wrap you know three to one point five, right? And map eleven to five. Yeah. 
Um, so it could go. I just didn't happen to draw it, but yes, absolutely. Um, so I think you see this is a big category. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big, big category, right? Um, it's um, it's got uh, a heck of a lot of objects, um, and uh, there's a distinction that she talks about, which I'm not going to get into, between a large category and a small category. Turns out there's a, a a kind of nice version of this we're going to be dealing with. It's a nice cousin of this called thin set, which are a set of all finite sets, which is more attractive for lots of reasons, for formal formal reasoning. And we'll be using that a lot, and we'll use what's called the skeleton of thin set. But we'll we may not introduce that until Halloween. Okay. Um so uh that was a joke. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so um okay, so this is a category, but let's let's go through some more notions of this. We've talked about objects or sets, but we talked about the interesting morphisms, functions between those sets. Talk about composition being composition of those functions, right? Now, where do these properties come in? A lot of this is still responding to Nona's great question about, about properties. So the, the unit laws, right? This is the first thing under the problems. These kind of stimulations for it to be nice, well-behaved, these axioms. So there's the unit laws, right? Um, for any arrow, A to B, call F. F composed with what? F after, what is that? One sub A, can you tell me? That's the identity on A, right? On, on its domain. Um, uh, doing F after identity on A equals F, which is equal to identity on B after F. Let, let's think how these apply here with, with this, with this, right? Um, I, answer, I used this to illustrate earlier why you can have self-morphisms that are not identity, right? Um, they just don't have each thing to itself to nothing to do. Things within the same domain, right? Here, um, what would it what would it mean to compose something with its identity? Let, let, let's suppose we we had, let's consider is even, right? Is even applied to three, five minus four here, right? Um is even a, okay, so now my, here we go. Is even applied to three, five minus four. Um, first of all, I'm saying it's codomains. What it's going to, the thing to which it goes, the thing whither it goes, um, would be three to what? If for is even, three would go to what? Well, false. Remember, job of a function is map. Each, each of the, the values in the domain, each of the possible values it can get to a particular value. So three goes to what? False. Five goes to what? Minus four goes to true. Good. Okay, now what I want to ask you is we're going to try to enact um, uh, um, we're going to try to enact this first element, uh, this first thing of the um, unit laws that, uh, uh, there that, that she gave. Okay? Um, so uh, she says F, so F here from A to B, right? F is going from A to B is, is even, right? Um, F is going A to B. Um, uh, here we go. F is going A to B. So F is, is even. So F after one sub A. One sub A is what here? A, A is, I should say, A is what here? Three, five, minus four. B is what? False true. One sub, so, so F is, is even. It goes from A to B, right? What is one sub A? Three, five, three, five minus four to three, five, minus four identity, right? Not, not just any old thing that that matters from three, five, minus four to three, five, it's, it's identity. It preserves, you know, it, it maps the, uh, you know, to itself in a 
in a way that reflects sameness, right? So if we were to do that first, remember, we're writing F after that, F after once a day. So first we do which one? We write F after, which comes first? Guess what? Yes, if we write F after, it's a circle, um, F after one sub A, right? Um, uh, then, then that's a matter of, we do one sub A first, and then F. What is one sub A here? Yeah, I mean, identity on three, five minus four, right? So imagine we, we have, you know, something from three, five minus four, a value from that, and then we perform the identity on it. What do we get back? The same, same thing we have, right? Right? If we have three, we get back three, right? If we apply the identity to it, right? Remember the identity? Is mapping three to what? Three to three, five to five, minus four to minus four. So if we, if we were to have any element from this domain, say three, we apply one sub a, we apply this, the identity to it, we get three, and then we apply is even, right? Have we changed anything beyond what we get with is even? No, it's exactly the same as is even, right? Doing the identity first changes nothing. It maps three to three. Change five to five, maps minus four to minus four. It, it's a no op. It's a no operation. It doesn't change anything. Do you get that? And then we perform is even. It's the same as just doing is even. Do you get that? Are, are you comfortable with that? It's like I say I have the magical power to turn myself into a lion, but first I have to transform myself into a human first. That's, then into a lion. that's, that's right. So you turn yourself into yourself. Yeah. And then you turn yourself into a lion. Well, um, you could, it's the same as turning yourself into a lion. Uh, Tony, are you good with that? Yeah. Do you imagine if we have a constant function? Yes. For example, a equal of a. Right. Can we say this is identity? Because every step I am. No, if if it's saying everything equals a specific value, like everything equals minus four, that's not going to be identity. It will be an interesting function. We'll be seeing that later. Okay, a uh, function like that. Um, there'll be lots of those constant functions we'll be dealing with. This, but identity is something different. Identity actually preserves sameness, right? It transforms three into three. It doesn't turn three into one fixed thing. It turns three into three, five into five. It's the function you said is kind of, it's kind of in a way the opposite. It's like the one we're talking about, it's like maximally, it, it's really careful. It doesn't collapse any things into itself. It turns each into itself. Whereas the one you said, you know, everything is turned into this one value, right? It turns out that's gonna be a really interesting function later. And we'll see it a lot, but it won't be right now, okay? So so let's go ask though about the other unit law, because that was just one half, right? We said is even, right? F after identity on A equals F, right? So is even after identity on three, five minus four equals is even, right? But the other side of it is what? You can just read it off. It's what? Uh, identity of B after. That's right. And what does identity of B mean? It means. False is false. false. true. Exactly. Notice, by the way, this I wrote, I actually drew in a self loop to make sure there was one. Like um, where we. Oh, gosh, that shouldn't say and. Uh, that was a dumb thing. I, I kept said like and true or something like that, or and false. Ah, and. Um, Ignore that. Um, uh, well, it takes the value when you answer it with itself. Sure, sure. But yeah, um, that it turns out would be false to false identity, uh, true to true. Anyway, um, the point is that ID, ID or one sub B is will map false to what? False to false and true to true to true. Oh, that's right. Um, okay, now if we 
remember how this is written down. One sub b after f, right? That's what how you can read this 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 um uh, this composed notation after, right? So what is one b after? What is identity on b? That is identity of false true after is even. What would it be? It's like we start with something from three five minus four. We we ask if it's even. What do we get back from that? We get a value in what set? Yeah, it's boolean. It's false or true, right? We have some particular value, right? We, we gave it a value of three, five, minus four. We get a particular value, you yeah? um, and and in false and true, and then what do we do with it? What is one b? Yeah, we 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 say if it's true, it's true. If it's false, it's false. So it doesn't matter if we. Do it after we get the value, we, the same thing, right? It's another no. So are you convinced based on this that these unit laws hold here? That that one sub a, you know, f after one sub a equals f equals one sub b after f, you know? Um, and you see why the ordering, because it's like you either first do the identity on a. And then you do this, or you do this, and then you do the identity of B, right? That's 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 kind of the choice. Okay. Okay. Um, but then that's not all. There's the associativity, right? And the associativity is what I wrote up up here, right? I didn't label sort of nicely, um, like uh, Virginia Chang does um, at ABCD, but we could write it like that, right? Um, and do you think that um, that this uh, is the case here? So, for example, um, let, let's ask. Let, let's take. Uh, so we need a string of three such arrows, right? Composition. How many arrows does composition need to compose um, to do its job? How many arrows does it need back to back to do its job to compose? Them? Um, composition needs two, right? That's what this this is composition. Right? It needs two arrows, and it gets back a result, right? Composes them, right? To be another function, right? The composition of length and is even a sub function. We can even define it, right? In a programming language, we have a function called length that takes strings and gives numbers and we have something you know natural numbers and take something which has natural numbers and ask if it's even and give booleans and we could compose them and define a function that maps strings to booleans right right you feel comfortable with that okay well let's let's ask that so that's composed but this one associativity takes three arrows as I think Tony was was, was thinking three arrows here right is it associative? So, so let's ask about this. What would it mean for it to be associative? Let's consider the mapping from real down here, down by that little thing that says cube, right? All the way up, here's the first arrow, here's the second arrow, and there's the third arrow there, right? What would it mean for it to be associative here? What is the case? That if you... You take a different path along the arrows to get to the same order. That's not you do that in a different order. No, it's actually not different. Don't don't worry about it flipping the orders. Um, it turns out it means look, it's gonna give the same result. If 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 I created a composition of of ceiling and absolute value, these these two right here, right? If I if I created a function, find a function which takes in a real and it gives out a natural, and how does it do it? It first takes the ceiling of the real and then it takes the absolute value of that, right? Um that so so that could be a function, right? That's the composition of these two, right? If I first do that and then I apply this even to that. That will be the same as if I did what? Anyone see where I'm going with this? 
You made a different composite arrow with the other two. Yeah, and you're not. exactly. I made a composite arrow with is even after abs. That that I could create a composition of something that takes an integer and and it returns false or true based on whether that's <laughs> an even integer um, by composing it is even an abs, right? Um, first it will make an absolute value and then use this even on the number with the natural number to ask if it's even. I could create that as a as a composite and then apply it. You know, uh, I could I could call uh, I could first right, um, I could call ceiling and then I pass it to that composite function and it gives this right um, and it gives true or false right. Um, either one will give the same result. Do, are you comfortable with that? That I I mean just it, you know if if that didn't work in our programming language right like we'd be in trouble right. Do you think that was why the Roman Empire fell? Maybe it, 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 no. <laughs> when I was young, the joke was the Roman Empire fell because of a of a null pointer error. <laughs> <laughs> that was the days of C. And C now, yeah, right, a second ball, the bus error. Um, uh, what's that? These are conditions for it to be well behaved enough. It clears the ground for a lot of worries like like if we have these properties it lets us do amazing things without a lot of worry now we're going to see that there are contexts later where associativity is not to use a category theoretic term that I'm, I'm not quite sure where it comes from it's not quite true on the nose um it's actually just like close to it and it's isomorphic um and there's many cases of this that we have in computer science where like you have um, something like a tree like this and like this. So, so each of these, Larissa will have seen this type of thing in the pilot's course, right? Uh, a, B, and C is not exactly the same as the tree that has, can you tell me where I'm going? Yeah, you're doing uh, yeah. like same pluses, like it's like the, uh -huh. but then you'll have it. Yeah, exactly. This is not exactly the same expression as this, but it's isomorphic. And what I mean by that is it's the same information. If I'm given this, I can give this. If I'm given this, I can give this. And in category theory, there's going to be all these cases, it turns out later we'll get to where you say, look, it's the same information. It's just, it's like, a rose by the name, by any other name smells just as sweet, right? It's, it's just it's just a rephrasing of the information. Tomato, tomato, potato, potato. It's just different pronunciations of it. Corollary, parole, right? Um, and uh, and so you consider them the same, and you say there's actually uh, just an isomorphism. That would be very common later. Or relax associativity, not for categories, but for other other contexts. But for categories, we want to be able to count on we'll make our life so joyous. Okay. Um, and joy will come in categories. Um, like the 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 dawn follows the rise and Okay. Oh <laughs> so um trust me on that. So um I'm so I was thinking that we could use this time to show some examples of of categories here, um, uh, like like these. But I want to I want to get any questions you have thus far before I show some examples. If you want to ask anything before I show examples, yeah. yeah. This might be asking to skip ahead. So if that's not the case, you can say no. But you explain a bit about what you mean by zooming in and zooming out. Like, what would it mean to zoom in on this category? So this category, oh, there, there is a notion of zooming in that's actually really cool. It's called the category of catalogs. And I'm yet a young Padawan of my categorical exploration, but I, I actually have, have seen this at times. And you could actually zoom in on this where you have, okay, get this. Get a look at this, okay? Um, so imagine each of these sets gets expanded so that three is an object 
five is an object, four is an object, okay? And, or minus four is an object today. Um, and then you have false and true, each being objects, okay? Um, so you have an object called false, an object called true, and what you do is you, so get where three maps to, uh, I guess it's false, three maps to false, five maps to false, false, and minus four maps to true via the kind of expanded version of the, of this is even, it's like, is even sub three or something like that, is even sub five. Um, so then when you talk about zoom even, are you saying we're zooming in into the context of is even in this space? So like we're trying to add that well, errors from is negative. But we're, that would be we're doing it actually for, yeah, I mean, I, I think we're doing it for any set in this category. We will then like make all their elements individual objects and for any morphisms mapping from one set to another we will have these kind of sub maps and it turns out this may look just like funky and weird but um maybe it is funky and weird but it turns out it's funky and weird in the same way that you have in database theory there's actually something just equivalent to this in actual database uses and mapping databases which has this, and we'll see it um, in a database context. So this is this actually corresponds to something that comes up with RDF, resource description format or something, and we'll see it actually turns out to be quite useful in some context. But um, uh, yes, uh, Larissa. Okay, so I have a question, but I have an interesting yeah. connection to another class, based on boundary, because... Uh in trying to do this recognition of patterns mm -hmm. and abstraction, it, it goes to the biological route. And it's like, oh, if you hyper zoom in on a cell, you have all these different interactions and whatnot going on. And every one of them can be treated as an agent. Uh, but if you zoom out a little, then you have your body as a human. And then you zoom out more, then you have like your interaction with other, and you zoom out more and you have like the universe. Yeah. So that's sort of how I imagine it, it's like these different. Yeah. Microscope that you're doing yeah. behavior group. So that's that's that is true, and category theory supports exactly that. So Eric, there's also going to be a context where you zoom out from. This. So I was talking zooming in on this, but zooming out from this, this whole thing, this whole category becomes a dot. Okay. It becomes a an un indivisible object. Um. Uh. So, uh, you know, that, um, 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 so, uh, um, okay, give me just a second. Um, um, so this becomes an indivisible object. This is a category in, in a category of categories, okay? And that turns out to be, very, very useful. Um, and, and, and it gives us great flexibility. Okay. So um uh yeah, it's it that's a matter of zooming in and zooming, zooming out. Okay. Um any other questions before I just show some glimpses of additional categories, and I think we'll continue on these next time. But yes, more recently. Um, like I can see where chapter three comes into play, but I would like to discuss it a little sure. because we talked about it. Yeah, yeah, patterns. yeah. You can recognize patterns between these, but I thought it'd be nice to discuss. Well, okay, so 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 yeah, there's so it turns out that categories and patterns have um th there's many places where patterns play role, okay. Um um, one, and I'll just mention a couple that strike me up the top of my head. Number one, it turns out that you notice that she says structure here. Remember her three divisions, data, structure, properties, hmm? properties of these axioms, these, these stipulations make an ISPA, but structure is composition and identities, right? What's the identity? What is composition? 
And again, if you understand that, we'll come back to it again. Okay. It turns out the rules of composition give the structure of a category. It's like they, they capture the structure, okay? And there are patterns in that structure that we may want to, to, to capture um, within a uh, within a, a category. There may be certain features in that structure that match um, certain sort of, uh, how to put it, they're, they're kind of exemplar or ex um, they are, there are cases of like the ultimate um, object of a, of a certain sort. And there's gonna be these things called universal properties um, and universal constructions, um, uh, which take advantage of the patterns of morphisms in a category, including by dictated by, by um, these uh, compositions uh, and, and and highlight these features like products, co-products that exist in a category, terminal objects, initial objects. And the, these are good names to you right now, but they, they turn out to be super useful. If you can identify them limits and co-limits, you can find, um, uh, you, you can prove things with the category and you can build up higher level sort of constructions. And so there are patterns that come out from the compositions that they're kind of the emergent patterns of the category. Two things combined yield one, right? Um, and you might imagine they're different, like a category that's a model. Um, it has identity and it has the ability to combine two things to get another. Um, it turns out those are some very nice categories to learn about. We'll probably see them next time, but, but the plus is different than times, right? One, one times one is what? One. One plus one is two, right? Um, these are different, right? The units are different. The thing that when you do times times, it gives the same thing back is what? So what? The thing that when you add it, gives that's, that other thing back is what? Zero, right? These are, these are different. And it turns out the patterns associated with kind of Plus are different from the patterns associated with with times. Um, so um, that's that's one way. There, there's some other ways patterns come up. Another way is that these these categories. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna just tease you by by throwing up some some example categories. That's what's on the board right now. This is uh, another category. This is another one. This is another one, right? Um, uh, here's here's some uh, here's some small presentations of small categories. Here's another one. Uh, this is to encode Petri nodes. This is for stock and flow. That's that encodes stock and flow right there. That category is the schema category to allow you to encode stock and flows. Now, what you have to do to actually encode them turns out to be use them as shapes and in particular shapes find patterns in other categories so it turns out this shape for example or this shape here or this shape called two or this shape is amorphism if you map it to another category you're finding it as a pattern in another category it's like it's almost like i'm doing a database search in this other category for things that have this kind of reciprocal structure that are that is shown here, or things where it maps from one thing to the next, or pairs of objects. So it turns out like categories encode patterns so that you can find them in other categories, which is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that would be another way that they they capture. That, that they are sort of linked up with patterns. They um they they can encapsulate these patterns, and that's why they're called shapes. Here. This is from David Spivak and Brendan Fong's uh, MIT Category Theory Program with Categories. Part of the use of this also there teaching was one of the instructors as well. Uh, these are kind of this notion of categories as shapes. But in order to understand how this works, 
we're going to need a little bit of patience because we're going to hit this when we get to what are called functions, which are now things between categories that preserve structure. Remember, I told you in a category, the general flavors, the morphisms are things that preserve structure. Um, one of the tragedies of many computer scientists only learning about kind of um, categories in a context of sets and functions. Where is that? Where is that category, that category of sets and functions that I have? One of the tragedies of only learning about it. Okay, I don't, I don't know what, where it went. Anyway, um, one of the tragedies of only learning about it in that context is um, that you, um, you get too caught up in thinking about um, mapping sets. And the problem is with sets, there's no structure. Where it becomes really interesting is when you're mapping these things that have structure, Petri nodes, stop and flow diagrams, state charts, um, uh, graphs, you're, you're, you're mapping the morphisms are structure preserving maps between these things. And that's what we're going to be seeing um, when we start talking about sort of pattern finding in one category to another. It's these structure preserving maps, these who don't find these patterns and say, aha, you've got these patterns in this other category that matches this pattern because the structure is preserved. Beautiful. And they make you. It's awesome. It's awesome. It's awesome. It's awesome. Um, so those are a few ways that categories capture. There, there's, there's other ways too, I think. Um, but a lot of it has to do with this fact. If you keep on coming back to this fact that, look, structure is captured in composition and, yes, in, in identity. What serves as the identity? You'll go really far. Because I kind of think of that as the generative part of categories. Like the you get surprised, like that's where they, like the composition rules is where they give their secret sauce. It's like where they give their their special rules, right? Um, we, it's, it's what combined with what yields what. And remember, when you have any pair of end-to-end -end morphisms, morphisms that go end-to-end, -end, there has to be, like, has to be a composition. That, that's something we, we don't allow flexibility saying, no, these two don't, even though they're in 10, they don't have a, a, a composition. No, they always have to have a, a, a composition of some sort. Okay? And, and that composition has to honor, has to respect, as we say, um, identity, meaning you compose identity with any other thing, you get that other thing out in either order. Remember, the, remember this is once of A, this is not once of B, that sort of Right. Um, anyway, I um, time is going on, and I've got my family needing to talk with me about my dad's situation. So um, I think we should. My my own thought is we're just getting into this chapter. This is like where the book starts to really build up, you know, some pretty deep insights. So my thought would be to continue on this chapter next time, and I could show you some of the glory of categories, um, but by showing you some examples of, of categories, we'll learn more about presentation of categories and how presentation of categories is not the same as the category. Um, and sometimes we have to stipulate things beyond the, the, the writings, we have to stipulate things like, hey, okay, going from A, A and then B, is the same as going B and then E. We write this stipulation here. Um, but we'll see that categories come and also, oh, there we go. Here we go. This is what we're on. But then we'll see that these come in all sorts of different flavors. Here's monoids, for example. Um, we have these encoding schemas, as I said. We have these um, with free orders like this, where you know, less than or equal to, remember that from, from uh, this book and, and division, right? We're gonna go through each of those. Maybe I'll speak to a, a bit of a question for your take home exercise. Like, what is the identity here? Hmm. If one thing divides another, what's, what's the identity? What's the, 
What's the left thinner equal to? These are thin categories. So between two things, there's only one morphism or zero. I, I, there, there's not like multiple ones between two and six or two and four because it goes into a multiple five thinner number. There's one from two to four because two divides four, right? And, and this is going to be a question. What what's what's identity here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's going to be a number of. It always has one thing. Right? It always divides. So why isn't it shown? Because it always. Because we don't have to go. And why isn't there one shown from two to eight? Yeah, it's implicit. <laughs> it, it follows. There must be. How, how do you know? Let, let me take that a little bit further, though. How do we know there's one from two to eight? You know, there's these two arrows from two to four and four to eight. How do we know there's one from two to eight instead of those arrows giving us one from two to 30? Because they can't, right? They only, if you have one from A to B, two to four, and then B to C, that's four to eight, then the composite, the composite, the composite, the, the result of composing those two goes from where? Two to two to eight. It has to goes from A to C, right? Um, so it so it has to. And the fact there's only one or zero here, so it means there's one from two to eight, right? There's no, it's not like, oh, well, it's this one and it's that one. No, no, no. There's there's one. There can either be zero or one from from uh for example, two to 15, is there one here? Is there, a, no, there's not, right? So this is the thin category. This is a category where between two objects, there's only one or zero. And the HOM set, I'm gonna leave you with this term, a HOM set, you remember what that term meant? The, the, the stuff that's like from mm -hmm. B to A. Exactly, so we talk about the arrows from one object to another being the palm set. It's a set of arrows or the whole collection of arrows if they're too big. I don't get I'm a I'm a I'm a simple money. I, I am a simple <laughs> I am a simple money scientist. I see categories and I click like. Um so so there's a there's a palm set from A to B here um that consists of zero and one things. Uh whereas let me ask this. Um for um someone okay for, between um between uh natural numbers and boolean how big do you think that home set is going from natural numbers to boolean probably infinite <laughs> yeah just like it is infinite right like there's at least one for every natural number is only true uh you know, if it's equal to natural number, you know, zero and otherwise false or whatever. And yeah, it's, 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 it's so this has giant home set of, you know, huge, whereas that other one is zero, right? The home set, the set of morphisms from A to B is what we mean by the home set. And you write it, if you have a category C, you write it as C from A to B. That's the HOM set. That's the set of all arrows, set of all morphisms from A to B. We write C A B. Or as if you want to be extra sort of the explicit value, you can write HOM of C from A to B. And anyone want to guess what HOM stands for? Homomorphism. Yeah, it's keeps structure preserving that thing. They can kind of collapse things in a consistent way, collapse them in a very consistent need. So, so, so you know, so a consistent way, a way that's that's sensible and and and, and careful. Um, but this is is the home set, and we we call it homomorphism not because always it's directly homomorphism, but because in a lot of cases it is. Homomorphisms of stock blood items, homomorphisms of petronets, homomorphisms of traps, and all sorts of nice homomorphisms. Yeah. Um, but they'll preserve structure. That's what the job of arrows are a lot of the time, preserving structure. So if the objects are stock and flood diagrams, the arrows be things that preserve the structure of the stock flood diagrams. Like Eric, the things that are in that are like in, used in uh, those pullbacks for doing model stratification. Um, uh, those, those are examples of homomorphisms of soft flow diagrams or the things that 
uh, that are involved in in uh, composing and composing to star flow diagrams. Um, well, let's let put both together. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So, yeah. would the long set be is even, or would it be every element from the natural number to the set of false and true? Because I thought it was from the object natural number to the object false. True. It is. So, so the hum set is so A and B here are the object. So we ask for the hum set between two objects. Yeah. So I'll ask from the hum set between here and then, and. Natural numbers. So this one, this the, oh sorry. Uh, um yeah. oh my god. There we go. Hey, come on, come on, get back there. Uh the hum set from this to this. Okay, the hum set from this object to this object consists of all morphisms. And these morphisms for this category are what? Morphisms are. Functions. So could it not just be the function is even? No, that's, that's all. That's the one I have to draw before class because I was too busy. But like another one would be is odd. Is odd. There's another yeah. one. Yeah. Another one is, you know, is prop, right? Yeah. Another but one is more so to clarify that it was the morphism itself, not the elements within the two It's the morphism. Okay. It's it's the morphism. Okay. It's the in this case, it's the function. It's like the collection of all functions that map natural numbers to booleans. In this case, to a moment. and there's there's infinite number. Of them. Yeah, it's, is it a prime? Is it a prime minus one? Is it a prime times three plus two? You yeah. know. Yeah. It, yeah. Exactly. It's like all sorts of uh, of of ones that that. Um, that that will map map full numbers to to uh, uh, to these um, uh, boolean values. Okay, cool, cool. Um, you're working. Th these are some of the core things, and I think it's worth spending at least uh, another another lecture just on this this opening chapter because there's a lot of stuff there with these triangles and stuff like that. Okay, cool. Thank you, everyone. Oh, uh, very important thing. Um, uh, I'm not positive, but I'll be here in person on Tuesday. Um, my dad is being transferred between hospitals because he's not doing well. Um, and I, uh, I'm uh, currently, I've got to talk right after this class with my sister and mom. And, and um, he's supposed to be transferred to one of US's best hospitals, Mass General. Um, it was supposed to occur today. It hasn't. Um, we're awaiting a bed. Um, and it's nip and tuck. And um, I'm, uh, you know, the the key person who's helping to guide them through uh, the, the care system here. So um, uh, I'm not sure what's going to happen. As I, I, I could fly out on a 6:30 a.m. flight tomorrow and be back Wednesday. Um, or I might not stay here and then fly up there after Narcissus defense, um, dis uh, dissertation defense next Friday. I will be here come next Thursday, I'm sure, because sort of that is the next day and I need to be here in person for that. So just to let you know, if I'm not here in person, I will do my best to make this class happen remotely. Okay. Um, but um, everything is a little bit in flux now. So thank you for bearing with the uncertainty. And I will uh, keep you posted. Okay. Yeah. Thanks very much. Oh, that's an interesting idea. Okay. Yeah, I I, I kind of like. Uh, I kind of like that idea. Um, that's that's kind of neat. Um, let, let me think about it, but uh, it would be good to get together and chat about it too if I am here. So I think that's a wonderful idea if I'm not available. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Now I'm lost here in my. Okay. Here we go. Okay, sorry. Ah, um, too many, too many big screens here. Okay. Stop there. Boom. Uh oh. Okay. Here we go.
Okay. Yeah, let me yeah, not not ready. Let's uh we'll push that, okay? Okay. Yeah. I'm, I don't don't